Hello and welcome to our eighth and final lecture in module four in uh, the summer cognition series. Today we're going to be talking about the neurobiology of memory or really the neuroanatomy, neurophysiology of uh, working memory. In particular we'll be talking about the um, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex or an important part of the frontal lobes which is why we'll also be talking about a mild traumatic brain injury because this is a part of the brain that is particularly susceptible to injury and traumatic brain injury. And so oftentimes we see executive functioning and working memory deficits in this kind of injury. So we'll start with a discussion of the role of the frontal lobes, then we'll talk about mild traumatic brain injury. Uh, then we're going to finish out by talking about the relationship between stress and working memory, uh, and then that will dovetail right into depression and working memory. Uh, we see uh, reductions in executive functioning and working memory both in stressful and uh, conditions and in people with depression and those two are definitely related to one another. And then finally just a brief foray into some new research in how uh, people are looking at trying to improve working memory. So let's start with the role of the frontal lobes. The frontal lobes, and in particular what's called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, or the DLPFC, whichever you find easier to roll off the tongue, is a key area involved in working memory and executive functions. So you can see this area is right at the front, uh, basically right underneath your forehead. Your eyes are, of course, right down in here. Um, but this in particular, this area, uh, highlighted is uh, the area that is particularly involved in memory and executive functions. Uh, unfortunately, this area is particularly susceptible to damage um, and is often damaged from mild traumatic brain injury. So here you can see somebody who has had a pretty severe contusion. In fact, looks like they probably had a what's called a subdural hematoma or a subdural bleed and, or an aneurysm, something that's pretty extensive damage there. Um, but what we want to talk about is how this part of the brain, in particular, this dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, is important and often damaged in mild traumatic brain injury because it is such an extensive problem. So uh, let's first talk a little bit about uh, MTBI, or mild traumatic brain injury. It can be caused by any concussive head injury. And so in particular, oftentimes we see this kind of whiplash uh, closed head, on, head injury, uh, and in this case uh, we're talking about a coup contra coup injury. So the brain hits uh, the front of the skull uh, and then uh, hits the back of the skull. So what happens oftentimes, for example, in a car accident is as you um, hit something, your brain hits the front of your skull. One of the problems is uh, your brain uh, floats essentially in, in fluid and when you come to an abrupt stop, uh, your skull may stop before your brain does. This is showing you essentially what happens to bull riders is as the, their head gets whipped back and forth, their brain also moves within their skull. And so you get uh, an injury to the frontal lobe and also then uh, oftentimes back in the occipital lobe. This is when people talk about seeing stars when they have a head injury. It's because that occipital lobe has been whacked pretty good. Um, and sometimes uh, that will cause um, visual effects and also the other issue to think about in this kind of injury is the potential for what's called a detached retina. So anyone who's had a significant head trauma really needs a good thorough workup to make sure there's no detached retina to determine the extent of any um, concussion or other concussive head injury and a good neuropsych workup to determine the appropriate um, way forward. So the causes of these kinds of closed head trauma uh, tend to include things like car accidents, uh, certainly sports injuries, things like football, hockey, rodeo, um, field hockey, lacrosse. Uh, I've had students in all of these uh, sports come in uh, with head injuries, basketball, all of them can uh, potentially cause uh, this kind of head injury. Uh, something new we're seeing, well not new, um, but in sort of recent decades, uh, we've been seeing um, difficulty with closed head trauma due to proximity to an explosive detonation, primarily in soldiers returning from uh, Afghanistan, Iraq, and Syria, and everywhere else we're involved um, abroad, uh, because one of the 
sort of tools of war in those uh, situations are improvised explosive devices. And while we have pretty good body armor for soldiers, so that concussive force um, sort of travels around uh, their uh, abdominal core, so it protects their internal organs, um, the concussive wave or force wave travels through their skull. Uh, in particular, water is a pretty good uh, transmitter of that kind of wave energy. And so you get this kind of, uh, this kind of head injury, oftentimes more diffuse than just the frontal lobe injury. So we're seeing very different kinds of, of injuries. It's one of the reasons why this is an area where there is a lot of research going on in terms of how we can treat this kind of head injury because we're seeing a lot of people returning from war with this kind of injury in addition to the car accidents and sports injuries we see anyway. So, um, closed head trauma can cause a number of different kinds of injuries. In particular, we're going to focus on two major injuries we see in uh, involving working memory and the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And one of these is what's called a subdural hematoma or a subdural bleed. So the outer uh, part of the brain is covered in what's called the dura matter. And it's a thick membrane that covers the entire surface of the brain. It's hard to describe. It's almost like a really tough um, paper almost, kind of like a brown paper bag almost, like that kind of a much tougher. Um, so it's a really tough membrane that covers this outside of the, of the brain, uh, and that's called the dura. Well, what can happen is uh, you can get a bleed in some of the other membranes that surround the brain, so there's a lot of blood supply up here. And so then, then can bleed underneath the dura and get trapped and then cause pressure on the brain. And so this is something that needs to be treated. Uh, the uh, blood flow needs to be uh, potentially surgically treated. The hematoma probably often not at times needs to be drained. I don't, I'm not a neurosurgeon, but oftentimes this requires some kind of emergency treatment because the longer this goes on, the longer the bleed goes on, uh, the more damage that can be caused. The other thing we see in uh, this kind of uh, traumatic brain injury is what's called diffuse axonal injury or diffuse axonal shearing. And so what you can see is say this person has hit uh, in a car accident, had an airbag deploy. Um, we get injury to uh, the axons of uh, this part of their cerebral cortex. So uh, if we magnify that, you can see sort of stretching and pulling, tearing, or complete shearing of axons. And this is diffuse throughout parts of the cortex. But this is what really oftentimes takes a great deal of time to recover from because those neurons have to either repair um, or uh, whatever functions were being uh, accomplished by these neurons. It has to be rerouted to new neurons or different neurons. Um, so there's a great deal of time involved in this kind of recovery. So some psychological effects of this traumatic brain injury can include things like loss of attention, in particular executive attention or ability to sustain attention, working memory difficulties, um, inability to multitask or switch from one task to the other, or uh, focus on one thing and ignore other things, hold information in working memory, all of these are potential difficulties. We can of often see language difficulties, sometimes personality changes. Uh, some of you may remember the story of Phineas Gage. He, of course, had a severe frontal lobe injury um, with a tamping rod that went through his um, uh, through his or the orbit of his skull and out the top of his skull, um, severing his frontal lobes from uh, the limbic system. You also see mood alterations, um, particularly oftentimes it's either primary or secondary to the other injuries. Obviously, some of the these issues can cause mood disorders, but also the injuries themselves can cause mood, mood, disorder, mood disorders. Sorry. You also see often episodic memory loss, and oftentimes you see what's called um, Temporally graded amnesia, sorry, I had to think for a second. Um, and temporally graded amnesia is something we'll talk about later in the course, but when you have this kind of injury, you can get a disruption in the consolidation of memories um, both prior to and following the injury. So essentially what you often see is um, a loss of, of memories surrounding the injury itself. And finally, you can get difficulty planning. Remember, executive functioning is important for planning for the future. Uh, putting the self in future, trying to figure out how to plan for later events, um, and finally some decision-making and problem-solving trouble.
So this is something that really needs um, some attention if uh, you've suffered this kind of traumatic brain injury. Uh, some important facts to keep in mind. Helmets can certainly limit injury, but will not entirely um, prevent injury. In particular, it depends on the kind of injury we're talking about. So, for example, hockey, they're pretty good at, at limiting head injuries uh, and football a little bit. But one of the things that's happening often in those injuries, it's not that the skull is being hit from the outside. It's the force with which uh, your skull is hitting something else. So uh, remember, your brain's floating inside that skull, and so it's the brain hitting the inside of your skull that's really causing the injury. So somebody who gets, as they say, their bell rung pretty hard in a hit, it's not because um, their skull has been injured in any way. It's because their brain has hit the inside of their skull. So helmets limit severe injury, so trauma that um, can certainly be fatal, you know, skull injury, that sort of thing, but they don't prevent injury. So bull riders, hockey players, football players, that helmet does a little, but it is not enough to stop brain injury. Important to keep in mind, uh, an important factor in traumatic brain injury is loss of consciousness. So if you lose consciousness and the length of time a patient is unconscious, or what we call down, are key factors in determining the extent of a head injury. Now again, this is all variable and individual, but it's important to keep in mind that that loss of consciousness is an important factor. We're also starting to see that working memory capacity is an important predictor of recovery. And so lots of important variables that go into this. So there are cumulative effects of multiple head injuries, particularly if the injuries are close in time. And the reason why we're, I bring this up under working memory is it is the, oftentimes the focus of this kind of injury is what we call disexecutive syndrome or loss of executive functioning. And it's particularly troubling because it is so central to so many things that we do. And so it's important to, to try to prevent this kind of injury. And so it's one of the reasons why I talk about it. So um, that's part of what happens with traumatic brain injury and loss of working memory. Other things negatively affect working memory as well, in particular stress and depression. So under conditions of high stress, the autonomic nervous system will trigger the release of cortisol from the adrenal glands. So this is that sympathetic nervous system response in that sort of fight or flight scenario. So whenever we're under acute levels of stress, combat situation, um, sudden emergency, um, anything that is suddenly severe and potentially traumatic is something we have to think about how it might, uh, how working memory might effect, be affected. So this is one of the reasons why people who are suddenly in an emergency have difficulty functioning and answering questions because they can't remember what's just happened. Later on they oftentimes remember pretty well, but during the incident itself their working memory capacity is pretty shot. We've seen how this kind of stress-induced working memory loss can result in some real tragedy. So um, there are a couple of important events in the sort of human factors of working memory uh, and stress uh, area that we have seen in the past. So uh, the USS Stark was uh, attacked by an Iranian um, Air Force jet and uh, significant damage and loss of life uh, to Navy personnel not long, either before or after, I can't remember where in the timeline this all occurs, the USS Vincennes um, shoots down an Iranian passenger jet with a significant loss of life, um, hundreds of lives lost there. What had happened, it turns out, in both of these events is the um, fire control and radar operators aboard these naval vessels were under significant amounts of stress and strain uh, during this kind of event. And what they found out was happening is they were not able to track information in the way that they were in, say, simulators back home uh, in the nice comfort of a non-combat environment. And so what they discovered is the key pieces of information they weren't able to keep track of is where each radar plot had come from. So the uh, Air Force jet had come from a military base, and the passenger jet had come from a passenger terminal. And that information just simply got lost in the chaos. Uh, 
So the Aegis radar system was developed in part uh, to respond to some of these kinds of issues. And so the Aegis radar system keeps track of all of that information for the operator so that it, it limits the amount of, uh, of cognitive load in that task. And it's a really important thing to keep in mind is what is the cognitive load of a task and what happens in a high stress environment and what can we do to support that cognitive load. So somebody who's under a great deal of stress has a different ability to cope with events. So when we're talking about somebody who's under high stress who jumps into a car to drive it, if it's not their car, what happens, right? What happens when under a high stress situation you try to make an emergency phone call and you, know, you have limited uh, capacity for processing that information? Where are you? How do you tell them where to come? Do you know even where you are? All of these things are really important things to think about under these high stress conditions. So one thing we know is that chronic stress in high stress events like divorce, death of a loved one, loss of a job, any of these kinds of stress events or even just sort of significant chronic stress, one of the things that can happen is that can trigger depression. There is a direct relationship between stressful events and the risk for depression. One of the things we see is that those stressful life events are a major cause of major depressive disorder. We also see that depression is associated with elevated cortisol levels that we see in stress, as well as reductions in executive attention and working memory as we see in stress. The problem is with depression, this goes on for significant amounts of times. And even we see that antidepressants might improve mood, but don't seem to improve these neurocognitive deficits, so other treatment options may be required. Uh, there are lots of alternative um, treatments for depression that include increasing exercise, um, cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, even some mindfulness exercises that we talked about previously under uh, our discussions of attention. And so other treatment options might be required, including perhaps um, other drug treatments. So one of the things we also see is that even after somebody's depression has dissipated, uh, we see that their neurocognitive deficits, in particular working memory deficits, um, may persist. So how do we then improve working memory, particularly for people who have working memory deficits. There are claims that you can train to improve your working memory, but these improvements often don't transfer to other tasks or domains, so all you do is get better at the operation span task. Not particularly helpful if you're trying to improve your reading comprehension. So one of the things that is a word of caution is that cognitive enhancement is uh, a nefariously difficult thing to try to tease apart. Uh, and so it's something we have to have a careful think about in terms of what are we trying to improve and does it actually result in the kinds of improvements we want. So be very cautious, particularly of anything you see online where you can do brain games and improve your cognitive functioning. Be very skeptical of those because they oftentimes do not work. Now, we do see that you can improve working memory capacity, but that doesn't transfer to things like fluid intelligence. Uh, there are more recent developments in things like transcranial direct current stimulation that show promise in improving working memory and may show improvements in other areas. But this is a very early area of research and I'm not comfortable providing any kind of recommendation, but just simply saying uh, keep an eye on this kind of research as it moves forward. Now there are some pharmacological treatments such as modofinil that show potential for improving working memory in people who have um, their depression in remission, or what we call remitted depression patients. So their depression has lifted, but their working memory is still sluggish. Well, modofinil, uh, which is a drug that has been uh, primarily uh, used to treat narcolepsy, um, does show improvements in working memory in these patients and recovering methamphetamine users. Later in the semester, we're gonna talk about how modofinil actually also shows improvement uh, for patients in fluid intelligence. And so this drug um, has some potential uses and abuses. Uh, I will say it has low abuse potential um, from just a recreational perspective, um, but certainly it could be abused in terms of taking it simply to try to improve your fluid intelligence, or perhaps that's something we should be doing. I don't know, that's a discussion we can have later on. But it is something to keep in mind, particularly for these patient populations. All right, so that gets us to the end of working memory. Here's a few key terms you might need to know for the exam and some review questions. Um, some of these 
may not be things we covered, uh, but might be helpful for you. So that gets us to the end of working memory and to the uh, midpoint of uh, this summer term. Thanks for sticking with me, and um, good luck on the upcoming exam.